About 18 months ago, I moved from the University of Glasgow, uh, where NEMA's uh, based, to the University of Sheffield to help set up the Sheffield Methods Institute. So we've been going for about a year and a half now, and that's grown quite rapidly to about 14 staff. Um, within that is the QSTEP Centre, which I'm sure you're all familiar with here. Annetta is one of our, one of our uh, QSTEP uh, lecturers. So maybe what's a bit different at, at Sheffield is that we've set up an in, a, a, a separate institute to, to house the QSTEP Centre, but also to has a, a, a broader remit, three kind of broad aims we've got. One is to address the deficit in method skills, both quantitative and qualitative. So QSTEP is obviously on the quant side, but we have a, a broader remit than that. Also, our goal is to, to bridge the divide between really good quality research and, and policy. So if you hear from a local authority or from, from outside the university, you very much want to make that connection with you. Uh, our, our kind of perception is that a lot of the really good quality research in social science, some, some of the stuff is, that we do in the UK, it genuinely is world leading. That kind of research is often a very long way from policymakers, and the kind of research that policymakers engage with is often more like consultancy work. So, how do we bring the really good quality work that we do much closer and much more understandable uh, for, for policymakers? And our third kind of aim is to is to bridge the disciplinary divide to actually be a centre that brings together academic disciplines fr from across the social sciences and beyond. Many of the big challenges, of course, that face society, whether they're climate change or poverty and inequality, um, they transcend those disciplinary boundaries. So we're very much an interdisciplinary outfit. And actually, this paper is kind of a good example of work that we don't think would, would have happened, certainly at Sheffield, if it wasn't for bridging the, the link between uh, myself as an economist, working with a, a mainstream statistician like Nima, and uh, someone with a sociology background like, um, like uh, Annetta. Okay, well, before I start on, on introducing this, uh, this particular talk, I, I should try and flag up some of the terminology that we've been struggling with, and we keep stepping back into confusing terminology. But we're talking about boundaries. But when we talk about boundaries, we're, really, we're going to try and use that word, if we can, to talk about social boundaries, as opposed to borders, which are just the administrative units or the aerial unit borders. They don't necessarily have any meaning, but that's the data that we've got. They, they're carved up into these geographical areas that have borders and they're, they're fairly arbitrary uh, from our point of view and what we're trying to detect is whether any of those arbitrary uh, borders coincide with social boundaries where you've got a, a kind of a step change. How did we get into this? So I, I started to become interested for a number of reasons uh, partly from a, a research visit to uh, Belfast, talking to the chief executive of the Northern Ireland housing executive there, about this idea of, 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 the, of frontiers between neighbourhoods. Obviously, Belfast is a very powerful example of that. What's it like to live at the frontier? Do, who, who wants to live at the frontier? So, and I began to sort of look into this and think, oh, actually, there must be a massive quants literature on um, the idea of social boundaries and their impacts. And, to my surprise, uh, at least in my initial uh, search, there's very, very little. Lots of stuff on the qual side, but much less so on the, on the quant side. Looking back in, into the economics literature, there's some theoretical work that's been done uh, back in the 1970s in the urban economics literature called the minimum border length hypothesis. And this basically assumes that nobody wants to live at the frontier between two neighbourhoods. That literature tended to be American, so it's looking at two social groups based on race, black households and white households. But the same ideas could apply much more broadly. And, and in our back of our mind, although we're looking at ethnicity in this initial uh, uh, kind of version of our work, we're very much interested in a much broader set of, of differences, which Annetta will, will talk about. I should say that this work is very much work in progress. So uh, we ha certainly haven't got everything sorted. We're still struggling with some issues and appreciate your, your feedback and your help with that. But basically, the, I mean, the minimum border length hypothesis suggests that if nobody wants to live at the boundary between uh, two very distinct uh, groups of people, then that will shape those neighbourhoods. It will mean that there will there'll be a force at work to minimise the adjacent frontier or the boundaries between those two areas. And so that will pull those neighbourhoods into convex shapes, into shapes that have relatively spherical uh, boundaries rather than having um, lots of intrusions or, or a granular kind of boundary. From our point of view, we're not really looking at this idea of a minimum border length, but 
it does have an important implication that if nobody wants to live at the boundary, then that will pull neighbourhoods into, uh, into distinct, distinctly uh, drawn social boundaries. In other words, you will end up with very steep boundaries uh, between two areas if nobody wants to, to live at the interface of those two areas. You, well, you might say, well, wait a minute, you know, I'd be quite happy to live at the boundary between two areas. I, I, I'm actually, I'd actually prefer to live at the boundary between two areas, and I don't have any particular preference for, for where I live relative to, to race, ethnicity, etc. Um, but well, Schelling, of course, argued, well, even if nobody wants to live in a segregated society, you could still end up with that um, if there's a weak preference for not being in the minority in your immediate neighbourhood. So let's suppose that everybody wants to live in a mixed society, wants to live in a mixed neighbourhood, but where you're at particular houses, you don't want to be in the minority. You don't want to be, it to be homogenous. I'm Welsh, so I might not want to be surrounded by Welsh people, God forbid, but I might want to have there to be more Welsh people than, than Yorkshire people in, uh, in my actual street. And what Schelling, of course, showed is that the, the macro consequence of that micro behaviour is that you don't just get a degree of segregation, you get you know, pretty extreme segregation, even though nobody really wants that. So actually, you could still get these um, bound social boundaries occurring, these step changes between neighbourhoods, even if nobody really wants that to happen. And the third thing I've become interested in is the kind of feedback effects of that, that actually what segregation can do is to minimise contact between these two groups. And of course, all puts kind of classic work on prejudice, his contact hypothesis suggests that if there's a, if there's a minimum amount of, of contact between groups, or if the contact is, is not in a, very, in a positive or, or constructive way, that can lead to, to, to accumulating misunderstandings and prejudice, prejudices between two groups. So if that's true, then that prejudice can then recycle itself into um, more aversion to living at the boundary and to steeper uh, step changes between uh, between between boundaries. Well, all that is very theoretical, and um, to our surprise, we haven't yet found any empirical qu qu quantitative research that specifically looks at these uh, boundary effects. I have come across work from my from working with uh, Nima and her colleagues in maths and statistics at Glasgow, particularly Duncan Lee's work not so much in these kind of social boundaries, but looking at boundaries in pollution and in health, where he's not focused on the impact of boundaries, but developed these Bayesian methods for actually simply detecting a boundary. How do you know whether an observed uh, social boundary is uh, statistically significant? So we're gonna draw on some of that work uh, in this paper. In terms of the impacts um, of boundaries, we're gonna look at at this idea that if there are social tensions caused by these social boundaries, then we, that might feed through to higher crime rates. And we haven't found any papers that look specifically at that question. There is, there is work that looks at the impact of segregation more generally on crime, um, but it tends to ignore the spatial component or, or to only consider it in a very simplified way. Our kind of approach allows for asymmetries and step changes, non-linearities across space in these uh, in segregation, I think hasn't been considered. So our work allows us, by identifying a boundary between areas, then allows us to look at these more interesting measures such as distance to social boundary and whether that um, has an effect on, uh, on crime rates or other measures of social tension. So this work is very much uh, tentative and exploratory at the moment, but um, hopefully that gives you a feel for the rationale for the study. Right, so I will um, take a step back and talk a little bit more again why, we, what we mean by social boundary and how it was theorized in literature. Uh, so the question who is um, um, recognized as being different and what difference is meaningful in different societies is one of the basic and key, key questions in many uh, disciplines in social science in sociology, geography, or psychology. But I think the most important thing here is that not all differences between people and social group become social boundaries. And um, literature defines that a social boundary is a difference that um, uh, defines who has uh, access to different resources, like power uh, in labor market, they have more pr privileges. And so social boundaries organize hierarchies in a society.
uh, as a in different disciplines, um, there were different terms employed to describe social boundaries. Uh, so, for example, in human geography, there is a lot of literature about the othering, who becomes defined as the other and socially excluded. In psychology, we have this um, uh, commonly known words of in-group, which, with which people identify and they have more positive feelings and attitudes to, uh, in relation to the out-group that people perceive uh, more negatively and um, if it's a relevant outgroup for them. Um, so the social boundaries are socially constructed and in different societies there may be different differences important but also some trivial uh, traits like color of the eyes. If you if we can recall the famous uh, Jen Elliott experiment when she divided students in a class just uh, by the color of the eye and telling them that this is an important mm -hmm. difference then th this would deteriorate re relations between the pupils. Uh, so for example, also in some societies, differences between different religions may not be important until something happens and then they become differentiated and the social boundary be uh, appears. Uh, so here you can see there is a map of words in Sheffield, which are the biggest area with a black borders and the colors uh, are, are different uh, lower output, lower super output areas. And this is a map of uh, social deprivation with different uh, levels of uh, social deprivation. The red one is more social deprivation. Uh, I just wanted to show you the map to say a little bit more how we differentiate social boundary from border. Um, so I think maybe I will use a mouse. So the first one, you can see that there is um, a yellow, uh, a green area with a red, adjacent red area, but this is far away from a border. So we could say that this is a, a social boundary within a border because there are different levels of people of different socioeconomic stages living within the area far away from each other, but this is within social border. Uh, the second example, you can see an overlapping border. You can see a border, uh, but there is no social boundary because on two sides of the border, there are people of the same uh, socioeconomic status living. And the final one is the, the lowest one. When the, there are people on, on both sides of border, there are different groups living and there is quite high difference between them, between the representation of both groups. So we can say that in here social boundary overlaps with a border. Um, yeah. So social boundaries can happen, can be present in different spheres of life, um, like labor market education, S two groups can be separated from each other, but in here, we will only focus when it is uh, manifested in physical space. Uh, and how we further conce conceptualize this. Uh, so this is a kind of a graphical representation of a border, which we see as a, that on both sides of the uh, boundary, there are different levels of, um, of different um, groups living. So on the one side of the border, boundary, you have much higher share of one group. Uh, on purpose, I'm not mentioning whether there is, it is ethnicity or socioeconomic status now. And on the other side, the, the representation of the other group is much lower. So um, we could s suspect that this is something that we would call a steep border because there is a quite high difference between representation of the same group on, on two sides of the social border. So we, then we would define it as social boundary. Uh, and there are different um, uh, implications for social relations. If there is a um, separation and clustering of, of uh, two different groups on two sides of a um, border and they, this border becomes social boundary, then um, going back to the theories that Gulen uh, describe, we could say that 
such separation means that the um, uh, opportunities for meaningful contact, which would uh, improve attitudes or uh, relations between groups is much lower. But at the same time, because um, if we also apply the minimum border hypothesis, people would live far away from the social boundary. So if they meet with each other, there's rather higher possibility that the contact will be uh, not of a good qu quality, rather it will be something that could be called bad contact because not all the conditions of a contact hypothesis will be fulfilled. Mm. Um, uh, thinking about these consequences of um, existing of a steep social boundary, um, what it would mean for um, social tensions at the level of crime. Um, here we, we could refer to a classic um, social disorganization theory saying that uh, the level of crime is highly related to the social disorganization and this actually um, reflects relation in the neighborhoods among residents. Uh, so uh, if um, so communities on both sides of a social boundary will be highly cohesive, then people will be willing to intervene when there is s some kind of a, when other people are breaking law or um, not, not behaving in relation to the norms. And this society will be, will have higher collective efficacy. Uh, and this could be rather more likely to happen in the heart of a community far away from the border. But the closer to the border, uh, this social order will be more threatened because it will be a kind of a transition zone between two communities. So none of the communities will be actually looking after social order in this area. That's why we would argue that um, the closer to the border, the boundary, the higher level of crime. Um, uh, so the first question we could ask which social differences become meaningful boundaries. And uh, most of the literature focuses on eth ethnic and racial diversity differences and the uh, difference in uh, economic resources in social socioeconomic status. Uh, but we, we wanted to ask a more complex question. What happens if the border actually, the boundary, uh, the social boundary actually um, it's not only in one dimension, but there are two differences that differentiate two areas, which uh, could be called a spatial fault lines, that there is an overlapping social boundary uh, in two dimensions, like for example, ethnicity and socioeconomic status. Uh, the term fault lines uh, comes from a literature of um, organizational psychology, and it means that uh, there is a fault line if one group is in dissimilar, not only in one, according to one characteristics like gender, but also in other characteristics like race. So for example, there is a fault line in organization if all women in organization are of minority ethnicity and all men in organization are of the majority ethnicity. And research shows that um, such a fault line uh, considerably deteriorates group relations within organization. So we could say that oh, if there is a fault line, like a spatial fault line, that there are two uh, social boundaries, two sorts of dissimilarities between those areas, um, there is more likely that uh, the crime will happen closer to the boundary. Um, and then this hypothesis could be described as a fault, fault line social boundary hypothesis. We would also expect that the similarity only in one of the dimensions like ethnicity and socioeconomic status would also increase crime because there will be groups from originating through, through, from uh, two dissimilar social categories. So maybe they will have different lifestyle and norms. But there is also literature, if I wanna go back, all right. There's also literature saying actually something opposite, that um, in a situation where there are 
scarce resources and two groups have to compete for the resources and usually these are also economic resources. Similarity in one dimension, me which can mean that um, there will be higher tensions between both groups. Um, and I could quote the work of Teifel and Turner from 79, so really old. But some groups are more likely to be perceived as competitors than others, and potential competitors must also be similar to the in-group on dimensions that make them likely to take resources. That is, they must be interested in similar resources and in a position potentially to take these resources. And later they explain that um, on dimi dimensions irrelevant to obtaining resources, perceived dissimilarity may promote the salience of Im immigrant groups and exacerbate the negative effect of group competition. So actually what uh, other psychological literature says that if two groups are similar in terms of socioeconomic status, but dissimilar in terms of ethnicity, this, um, this similarity uh, will, this dissimilarity in terms of ethnicity will be more salient because they are similar in terms of comp that they compete for the same resources. So actually this would mean that not the, the highest level of crime or intentions won't be around the boundary that two groups who live on both sides of a boundary are dissimilar, but, but rather that um, are close to the boundaries that people who are, are similar in terms of socioeconomic status, but dissimilar in terms of ethnicity. So there are two different actually ways of, um, two different argumentation um, we haven't, we, ha we don't know exactly which one is now correct. We would like to test this hypothesis. And for today's presentation, we present only results for one dimension. But if you, if you would like to give us any feedback on this um, preliminary hypothesis, we'll, we'll, we'll welcome them very much. All right. So on to the stats, which I'm sure you're all thrilled about. Um, so. We have two stages in this sort of identifying boundaries approach on aerial data. And the first is just to take a statistical method to try and identify statistically significant changes in the spatial distribution. And in this case, we're looking at ethnicity in white versus non-white. And I'm going to explain the method that we're going to use for that. It comes from a paper by a colleague of mine called Duncan Lee and his collaborator Richard Mitchell. And it's available in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series C from 2013, and essentially it takes a sort of spatial model that assumes uh, smoothness in the space, uh, in the, in the uh, surface of the outcome of interest, and starts looking for sort of step changes or sudden abrupt changes in level um, by looking at this sort of smoothness and seeing where it, it actually doesn't follow. And so we're going to take a look at the minority populations and compare two sides of the boundaries and see whether or not they should match up in smoothness or if they're a big step change. Now obviously sometimes something that is statistically significant isn't necessarily of substantive interest. So if I have a difference between proportion of uh, minority in one area of 0.9999 and the proportion of another area 0.9998, then you know that's technically statistically significant but not really um, very interesting and probably not likely to have a big impact on other um, factors. So after we find the boundaries from a statistical sense, we take a threshold to look at um, boundaries that would be interesting in a substantive sense. Okay, so we basically take a look at each region, and here we're going to present data on Sheffield, um, but obviously we're going to take a look at other cities as well to see if there's differences in patterns of this. Um, and it's partitioned, so it's basically um, split into areas. So here you might have four different areas, and so they're non-overlapping and they cover the whole space. So here we're going to be looking at lower super output areas. In Scotland, the equivalent um, area level would be data zones. And we just index them from A subscript 1 up to A subscript N. So we have N sub areas within the overall area. And within each area, then, we have the count of the number of people who are in the minority, and that's our Y sub K. And then we also have the count of the population within that area, so N sub K.
And so this is a classic sort of binomial distribution, you know, number of one class versus another class out of a total number. And so we took a look at a Bayesian locally adapted spatially, uh, spatial conditional order regressive model, and I'm actually going to explain what that is in a second, for a binomial dependent variable. So the original paper looks at a Poisson um, variable. It's looking at the health um, area and was looking at counts of diseases for disease risk. Um, but it does frame the, the general model in terms of any sort of generalized linear model. Okay, so this is the only um, page with equations, I think, so <laughs> as long as we get through this, we're laughing. Um, so we start off with what we call a hierarchical model. So here we're saying that basically the count of number of people who are uh, in the ethnic minority is binomial with the overall population for that area, NK, and the uh, parameter that we're interested in the is the probability of being in the ethnic minority, the proportion within that area that are in the ethnic minority for all the areas within the city. And so we take a standard model to this. So this is just taking this proportion and taking a logistic transform and setting it equal to a linear equation. So logistic regression, basically. So we have our standard beta naught, which is our intercept, which is basically the, uh, the log odds for, uh, on average for the whole area, for all the areas within the city. And then the second part is what we're interested in, which is a random effect for each of these sub-areas. And so this is where we see the spatial variation. This is where mo we're modeling that. And this is where the conditional or regressive thing comes in. We put a prior on those random effects, which is a conditional order regressive prior. And so we basically say for area K, the variation in space, according to this sort of ethnic minority, depends on the other random effects for other areas. So this minus K indicates all other areas except for area K. And a W matrix that will indicate um, the spatial structure of this um, city in this area in, in relation to other ones. So to give you an example, if we have areas A, B, C, and D here, so we can see that area A borders area C, shares borders with area C, D, and B, but D only shares borders with C, B, and A, and so on. So not a terribly good example, actually. <laughs> so they all have borders with each other. Okay, so if we then want to represent that with a W matrix, that's just basically a symmetric matrix with the same number of rows and columns representing all of the areas, and each pair is a binary entry, which indicates whether or not we share borders with that area. So A short shares a border with B, so we have a one there, a shares a border with C, one there, and D. And so let's say that D doesn't share a border with C. So let's say the two of them look like that. Slightly more interesting. So we have A sharing a border with B, C, and D. B obviously shares a border with A because A sh shares a border with B. And similarly for C and D. So C shares B shares a border with C, but not with D. So basically, and then C also shares a border. She, she doesn't share a C doesn't share a border with D. I'm, making, I'm confusing myself. Okay, so B shares a border with C, A, and D, but C doesn't share a border with D. And so this is symmetric then, so we have entries for each of these. And so basically what we're saying with this is we want to average the random effects mm. for areas that border the area that we're interested in. So if the area that we're interested in is area D, for example, then we're going to take the average of the random effects for A and B, and that's going to be our prior for the random effects. And so it's a weighted average, so this lambda indicates roughly how strong the spatial autocorrelation is, so how strong the effect of neighboring areas is on the area that we're interested in. And the variance of that is roughly proportional to the number of neighbors that that individual area has. And so then we have some hyperpriors. So these are basically chosen to be as diffuse as possible, so to have as little effect as possible, so to let the data really drive the analysis here. And so U, basically, the vector of U, random effects, indicates how this um, effect changes over space. And it's expected to be a smooth change because we're averaging over areas that are similar. And so that's fine as long as they're similar. But suppose we have neighboring areas, and let's say D now looks like this, and so we're using color to indicate how similar these areas are. Now, A borders C, B, and D, but we really shouldn't be averaging A with D because D is quite different. And this would indicate 
a social boundary, right? And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to see where these W indicators are one in the original neighborhood structure, but change to zero if we're considering the actual outcome of interest and how similar these areas are. Okay. So um, that is the standard car model, which ignores all of this. It, this W is fixed, just based on the neighborhood structure. And we assume that there's this smooth variation, no real sudden drops or changes in the surface. So to extend that, we make W part of the estimation, basically. And so now we have two sets of parameters to estimate. The random effects U that represent the sort of change in space of the outcome of interest. The hyperparameters in the model, which we don't really care too much about. The intercept. And now we have the spatial weights matrix, which we allow to change. And so there's an iterative procedure, which basically starts off with a standard car model. So we have the original W from the neighborhood structure. And we find the estimation of the parameters using a sort of either an MCMC routine or some approximation of that. We assume W is fixed, but now we treat W as something to estimate in the next stage. And so what we do is we say, let's say our, this is our original W. An entry of W, if it's zero, it stays as zero. So if it, in the original neighborhood structure, if they didn't border each other, if they weren't already sharing information, they're not going to suddenly start sharing information. But WKL being 1 can now change to 0 or stay as 1. And if it changes to 0, that again is indicating that we have a found a social boundary between those two areas. And so the decision we make based on that is uh, down to 95% credible intervals. So we have a pair of areas K and J that are originally bordering each other. And we check to see if the credible intervals for the random effects for the two, those two areas match up or not. And so if they don't overlap, remember this is the spatial variation in the, in, this, in the model, so then that's saying the sort of effect in area K and area J are really different because these credible intervals aren't overlapping. And so that's basically saying we shouldn't be sharing information between these two things because they're actually quite different. And so we change this one to a zero. But if they do overlap, then we're basically saying they're similar enough that we can still borrow strength because there's a smooth change in the surface between the pairs of these two areas. And so we keep the WKJ as one. And we go back and forth. So now we have a new W, and we feed that back in here. We estimate the parameters of the model. And then once we have the parameters estimated, we estimate W. And we go back and forth between these two steps. And the termination con condition is exactly what you expect. Basically, you'll stop if the W stops changing, because you know, it's not going to change anymore after two steps if it's identical or if there's a cycle that happens, if you have W1 and W2 that keep iterating back and forth. In about 99% of the time when you run this model, you will just get a single W that it converges to. And the nice thing about this is that these models are implemented in R using INLA. Now, the reason why INLA is important here, it is the integrated nested Laplace approximation, is instead of using MCMC, which can be kind of slow and long to estimate the car model, so this stage here, Inla just creates an approximation of that, and it does it in about one hundredth of the time that the MCMC takes to run. And so we can do this iterative procedure because it doesn't take us too long to actually estimate the parameters in one of the steps. Um, the approximation is reasonably good. There's a number of papers out there that compare the approximation of Inla to the actual MCMC run. Okay, so this assumes now that we have these Ws that we can identify where they were originally one, they've gone to zero, and that indicates a pair of areas that border each other that have a social boundary between them. But that's a statistically significant boundary that's not necessarily, as I say, a large and substantively interesting one. So we just set a threshold to ensure that the boundary is interesting and sort of substantively away from zero. Okay, and so that's the identified of the actual boundaries, now we're saying, well, do the boundaries matter? Do they actually have an effect on other variables? And one of the variables that we're interested in is crime rates. And so we've got two essential groups that we're interested in here, and they're always pairs of adjacent areas. So we have pairs of adjacent areas that have a boundary between them. So they're very different in terms of this um, ethnic ethnicity variable, and pairs of adjacent areas that don't have that difference, that they don't have the boundary between them. And so we have crime data from the South Yorkshire Police Force in 2011 
that was individual crime crimes that's aggregated up to the aerial level uh, at the lower super output area units. And this is in the Sheffield travel to work areas. And Gwilym very kindly put in the explanations of the acronyms for this poor statistician. So we're interested in the difference of the crime rates between these two groups. And so obviously there's a lot of dependence between these observations because a lot of these pairs will share a, an observation between them. And so we can't do a standard hypothesis test here because not only will it, the distribution not look very normal, but we don't have that independence um, to allow for it. So we took take a look at using a non-parametric procedure, which is here we decided to use a permutation procedure. And so at the identification of boundaries level for Sheffield's um, travel to work area, you get an awful lot of statistically significant boundaries. So here the colors indicate the proportion within each of these lower super output areas that are in the ethnic minority. And so you can see near the center we have a large proportion of um, areas that have high ethnic minority um, proportions. And as we spread out, it's sort of smoothing down. And so we wanted, this is the statistically significant boundaries, so we take the threshold now, and the threshold we to chose to use was just the mean of the differences between the pairs of random effects plus one times the standard deviation of those um, pairs, different differences of pairs of random effects. And when we do that, we drastically reduce the number of boundaries that we see. And obviously, you know, this is one, one possible choice of that boundary um, threshold to choose. Um, we're going to take a look at some sensitivity analysis to see how that affects results later on. Okay, so um, permutation significant um, test. So here we have two columns. The first one is those pairs of adjacent areas that don't have a boundary. And the second column is the pairs of adjacent areas that do have a boundary between them. And we've got the differences in crime and the average of those for the total crime rate in the first row, burglary, and then violent crime in the last row. And so the difference between these, it's reasonably high for total crime rate, maybe a little bit lower for burglary crime rate. And in terms of signif statistical significance, at least, all of them, the first two are definitely statistically significant. Violent crime rate is sort of marginal. Um, you could argue it's non-significant, but it's close enough to the cutoff that it's still interesting. Okay, so this is just to give you a look at what the actual permutation test looks like. Um, we did a thousand runs of these permutations, and the lines indicate where our observed um, statistics were for the mean differences between the two, and the, the density dashed lines indicate the rest. And so you can see they're all fairly far out in the tails. Okay, so just to look at the distribution now, because we were looking at the means before, and now we want to see do the actual distributions change? Is it not just the center? So here we're looking at the total crime. And so on the left, we again have these geographical neighbors that don't have a boundary. And on the right, we have the pairs of geographical neighbors that do have a boundary between them. And unsurprisingly, both have fairly large um, percentages at zero. But you can see that there is greater um, proportion of the density going further out to higher levels of crime in the um, boundary areas, pairs of areas, than there is in the non-boundary areas. The violent crime sort of shows a similar picture. Again, you've got even more zeros because that, you, know, you have less incidence of these. But again, you've got more extreme values for the model boundary pairs um, than you have for the non-boundary pairs. And even just the standard has a higher proportion falling within sort of reasonably high levels. Burglary, similar picture to show except Instead of a unimodal distribution, you can see we have a sort of bimodal distribution for the pairs of, of um, model boundary um, areas. Um, and again, we see larger values, larger proportions of values in the higher range. But again, he, but this time here, we can see that there's more spread in this. And so if we wanted to compare these distributions as opposed to just pairing the means, we could probably take a look at something like a Kolmogor of Smirnoff test to see if there's genuine dis differences in the distribution rather than just the centers. OK, so that was really just taking aerial level crime and comparing it to the aerial identified boundaries. But we do have information about individual level crime. And so what we wanted to do was take the aerial identified boundaries and see if there was an effect on the individual crime, not just on the rates over the areas. And so what we did here was we took a look at an inhomogeneous, in, I can say this, inhomogeneous spatial process model of the boundary effect on crime. So we included that as an effect. 
And essentially, we're just, the outcome is trying to model the intensity of crimes over the region in space. And we include covariates like the spatial covariates um, that have the distance to the city center, the distance to model identified social boundaries, and the non-social borders. And so the intensity in this Poisson model is lambda u, and it's an exponential function of an intercept plus the ratio of these covariates times their parameters. Okay, so thank you. All right, <laughs> I'm going slower than expected. All right, um, so this was a bit disappointing um, because it gave us sort of what we wanted and sort of what we didn't want. Because what we wanted to see was a negative covariate for bound social boundaries, which we got. Um, because that indicates that the further away you are from a social boundary, the less likely you are to see crime. That's good. But if you take a look at the distance to the non-social borders, you'll see that it also is negative and it has a higher coefficient, which indicates that the effect of the non-social borders is actually higher than the effect of the social boundaries, which sort of, in some ways, we felt contradicted what we said before. Um, but there's an argument that actually city center has a different effect on boundaries, and there may be uh, something to be said for looking at interaction effects between these things. And also, there's something to be said for we're identifying these boundaries in areas. And if I identify a boundary here, when it's actually happening somewhere in here, the distance to crime to this boundary actually doesn't make much sense because the boundary is actually in the middle of the area. So we're comparing area level identified boundaries versus individual level crimes. You've got a sort of mismatch of these things. And so we want to tr try and move to a lower granularity possibly for the identification of the boundaries. First of all, we've tried to, to, to come up with a rigorous way of ident identifying social boundaries. So that's the first thing we've been trying to do. And then we've been saying, well, does that matter? Do these social boundaries have an impact? Um, proximity to social boundaries or differences between areas that are next to, to these social boundaries, do they have higher rates of crime, for example? What we found was that in the aerial units test that compared areas that ha had a, uh, an adjoining uh, social boundary we did find a statistically significant effect. When we tried to then do that in a slightly more fine-grained way by looking at proximity to those social boundaries of individual crimes, um, we run into some problems uh, with that, partly because we think that, well, these aerial units are smaller near the city centre, and that's also where this, the uh, non-whites tend to be concentrated. So um, it, this model is struggling uh, to, to disentangle those conflated higher uh, density effects um, closer boundary effects to, with our uh, uh, cl close to social boundary effects. What are we going to do next? Uh, well, first of all, we want to apply this to different cities. We've only applied it to, to Sheffield, as fine as Sheffield is. is, is we'd like to see how, how uh, this works across different cities, but also across different, different dimensions. We've only looked at ethnicity, but actually social difference and social similarity, as, as uh, Annette pointed out, combined with other kinds of difference might be even more interesting and even more potent. So we're interested in religion, social class, and, and, and other factors. And then we, we want to try and find ways to address the conflation issue in the spatial model. And any suggestions that, that you have on that would uh, be most welcome. Thank you. Thanks,